record broadcast preview All right, about to play the music. Hey guys, how's everybody doing? Hey, good. good. Yes, we're actually live and streaming. You guys look confused. Sorry, my countdown this time was just. Yeah, one because <laughs> I can't count to three as we've seen over and over and over again. So how are you doing? I was trying to see if you could tell if you could tell that my video was frozen temporarily, but <laughs> oh, you were doing the actually it looks pretty. It actually looks pretty good, except you could see my arm move. So was that like Naked Gun? Or was it like the end of it? They all just sort of stopped. It did the freeze thing. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah freeze yeah. frame. So today's show is a little different. Right? Uh, we have a confusing array of Andrews here. We have, I don't, how should I refer to you guys to differentiate? Uh, why don't you just call me G for this show? No, I'm not calling you G. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not calling you G. Yo, G, no. <laughs> what what you think about the games? Uh, so, <laughs> Andrew number one, Andrew number two. <laughs> Mustachioed <laughs> Andrew and, and just, plain faced just, Andrew. Just just call the other Andy Mr. Andy Puppy. I guess that's too many syllables. That's what also about, about just, worse than G. Just call me Dev Hammer. I don't know. All right, the Hammer. Hey, Hammer. <sighs> it sort of goes with the, the G thing. Why, right, why, do so, you have, why do you have a problem with the G? Yeah, what's the problem I don't know, with It G? just doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound right. Yo, G. Yeah, Yo, that's G. just not. <laughs> it's like the Alley G thing, you know? And I'm just not <laughs> no, seeing not you so do an much. Alley G. Not well, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think Andrew or I will have any issues with confusion. So it's only you, Pete. So you got to make that decision. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm pretty pretty sure, Andrew Parsons. If you say Andrew, you're not talking to yourself. All right. That's so right. anyway, yeah, so uh, today's show is about game development and just kind of cool game stuff and everything. And you know, as usual, we started a couple of minutes late because we had some interesting technical difficulties. Because it wouldn't be this show if the technology didn't change every single week, right? This is also the first show uh, where we've got a guest, right? So, hey, uh, hey. Andrew Parsons, why don't you introduce yourself? Okay, well, you've taken away first part of my introduction, my name. Uh, I'm an Aussie living in Seattle. Uh, I work with these two clowns. Uh, I worked for five years in Microsoft as the academic evangelist uh, for Australia, then New York. Uh, I've run a, the games uh, development competition for Imagine Cup for five years. And now I work with Pete directly uh, on all sorts of stuff. Uh, I'm responsible for indie game development uh, for Windows, Windows Phone, and Xbox One, which we're not talking about today. No, we're <laughs> not talking about that, but still very cool anyway. So, so great. So we... we are so we often talk about or show off our marvelous shirts, and I see you've got a pretty awesome one there. So you want to oh, yes, kind of show the whole thing? Uh, yes. Uh, and and as I said, shot. pre-show, my response <laughs> that was, to that shirt is, I hate you. Mostly oh, just because you get to play with Project Spark, and I don't. Nice. Oh, yeah, yeah you mentioned that, that T-shirt, Pete. I got one, too. <laughs> I got one so too, so yeah. what's the... We, you couldn't really see in the camera what yours uh, says, though, Pete. Let's see. You got, you got to get the angle uh, right, yeah. Because it gets what? 
Uh, get, for, for folks who can't see, it says get a job. Get a, get a job. Yes, yeah. great advice. It's it's the it's the ungiving tree. Yes, <laughs> exactly. It's the <laughs> uh, the the real parenting tree. So here's yeah. the deal, guys. You know that crackle that we're having um, that sort of held us up just a little bit here. Yeah. Uh, if I turn on desktop presenter here to uh, share my page. So any of the links, it comes back. So I so I close that down. So we're going to have to mime anything that we want to show here and not actually show links or anything at this time. Or maybe if you oh, print great. out that the should, web page and hold it up. Yeah, that might be good, right? <laughs> well, I could hey. run downstairs and get my Surface. You could do that. Uh, or could you could do that. Not. Just put it up to the camera. Did you update it? Uh, it's actually it's updating as we speak. I don't know if it's finished yet. Ah, cool. I did what update my... Uh, I updated my carbon yesterday and uh, very happy with it. Cool. Yeah, this I've been running RTM and stuff here for a bit on these. I haven't updated to any GA updates here, um, but I did download the new Facebook app today just to try that out. Yeah, and I'm that's hoping nice. to try it out on my Surface because, like because quite honestly, the Facebook web page on my Surface is just about the slowest experience I've ever had with anything because it's just there's just too much going on on that page that assumes that you've got multiple cores and threads going on that you just don't have on these low power devices. <laughs> it's just a web page. Seriously. Yeah, right. really? Yeah, it's just How a web page. <laughs> it's HTML and that's it. So we're going we're gonna to talk about games today. And yeah. uh, you know, we'll do the usual. Uh, Andrew, since you're, you've never been on the show before, you don't uh, realize, but we usually like to start off with something cool that we've run across lately. Uh, of course, 8 one is cool. Um, but the other thing sort of in, in the theme of the show here is my son has gotten me addicted to Minecraft, right? Oh, no. Uh, oh, no. Yeah. Run away, run away. <laughs> now, I, I'm playing Minecraft. sort of the wimpy version on the Xbox. It's still okay, but it's got a tiny world and all that stuff. No mods, all those things. On the plus side, it also doesn't have uh, millions of screaming 12-year-olds like trying to like talk trash to me all the time and everything. Um, but I've gotten into the construction aspect of it. It's like big Lego blocks in a virtual world, and I've gone and created a bunch of skyscrapers and pyramids and cannons and bizarre things like that. Um, but it's a time suck. You will sit in front yeah. of the TV, and you will start playing, and then you'll notice five hours later that you should have been to bed six hours ago, right? Um, exactly. But it's tons of fun. Yep. Tons of fun. I like, yeah. I like to dig with dynamite. Oh, I thought you were going to say, I like to dig. I like to dig. Yeah. <laughs> I do like to dig, but with dynamite. <laughs> it's like, blowing, is this, is this a real world thing or a Minecraft dynamite. thing? No, Minecraft. Okay. I didn't know, you know if I should be dig, avoiding your you neighborhood. Dig a hole straight, you dig a hole straight down in, in uh, creative mode, and then as, as you back out of the hole, you leave yep. dynamite behind. And then you light the top piece and you make a yes. huge, huge cavern. It's you know what's funny fun. is I did that the other day. So my, my five-year-old daughter is also playing. And she just likes to watch everything burn. She is that person where she starts just lighting things on fire so, and exploding so things and digging. So you're saying she's the joker? Yeah, she, yeah she's, she's kind of the joker on that. Well, she gets <laughs> bored after about half an hour. My son's got mm -hmm. my my interest in games where if you park me in front of it, I'll be there for quite a while. Um, my daughter is more like her mother where she can't sit in front of a screen for more than about half an hour before she needs to get mm -hmm. up and run around, right? So it, it, totally right. un-American of her, um, but she likes to just go in there and just destroy stuff and be, and be done with it. What about you guys? Sounds like my kind of player. Yeah. What about you guys? Um, so my latest new thing, oh, and I forgot to show my t-shirt. I'm, I'm rocking the old school MSDN. And for folks who aren't on, you know, aren't kind of Microsoft geeks, this is the Microsoft developer network and kind of nice old school version of the M do MSDN t-shirt. you have a tattoo of that? No, I do not have a tattoo of that. Oh, However, okay. I do have <laughs> this box of awesome. Can you see robotic that? Robotic arm. Yes. Yeah. I think that's probably going to be familiar to you, Pete, because I think you actually have one of these. But uh, my I'm wife cooler actually, than you because uh, I have two of them. <laughs> shut up. My <laughs> wife, for her birthday, wanted to go to Hobby Lobby, which, you know, 
there's maybe one or two aisles that for guys hold any interest whatsoever. The rest of it's all kind of dried floral arrangements and, you know, and macrame and I don't know what else. <laughs> so I you managed to find the one half aisle. the audience who are men who are interested in dried floral arrangements and macrame, I'll have you know. If half of our audience are <laughs> interested in dried floral arrangements, I think we're probably doing it wrong. What yeah, kind it's of probably show not the right podcast. Into, I think, so anyway, this actually, this guy, I don't know if yours did, but this guy comes as a kit. So I'm going to spend some time with my 10-year-old and 6-year-old putting this sucker together. And then yep. it looks like I had actually asked you, Pete, whether you thought this was uh, able to be controlled by a microcontroller. Looking at the directions, it looks like absolutely I should be able to just plug it into the pins of an MCU and... Uh, write some programs. I'm thinking Connect has got to get involved with this guy at some point. Yeah, the the pins not, on that, if I remember correctly, in. just directly power each of the individual motors that are on there. It's nothing complicated yeah. at all. Right. So Very get that cool. puppy hooked up to a uh, to a Connect and start driving it with my arms. Yeah, that's a great project to do with your kids. That that one right there. So just putting it together mm -hmm. will take you an evening. Or, or more if uh, the kid is less help than they are uh, <laughs> otherwise, right? You know You've met my children. Yes, I have. <laughs> uh, although he might do fine. So what it about you, Andrew Parsons? Kid. What's new? Well, you've invited me on the show because I'm a gaming guy. And, uh, and so unsurprisingly, the stuff for me that's new is, is games. So these are the games I'm currently playing. And I'm playing them all simultaneously. So Diablo 3 on the Xbox 360, which this is... Diablo 3 on the PC was the first game I returned to GameStop in quite a few years because I just I was going to ask you if this the, uh, sucked like everybody was saying the PC game yeah, did. Yeah. The 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 console version light years better. They've they've done a whole bunch of good stuff with that and one one thing that's really important for me is it's mo uh, it's same screen co-op up to four players and everyone who plays who has their Xbox Live account signed in actually gets achievements. Uh, unlike Many, many other games that play co-op where only the first player gets the achievements, everyone gets them. So that's really cool. That the other cool. one I'm playing is is obviously uh, GTA V. Yes. Uh, that's, which, as uh, this is a family-friendly-ish show, I won't say any more other than uh, <laughs> it's a great open-world game. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah not, so much, the the uh, right. <laughs> not so much on the family-friendly. Not so much on the family-friendly content. Yeah. So exactly, on YouTube, yeah. I subscribe to a guy who does um, everything wrong with movies. And so he, yes, he takes yeah. like individual movies and rips them apart, right? He just did one for one of the in-game movies in GTA V. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because the, there's a movie. Weird. You can actually go see a movie. It's a 10-minute right. long, you know, And it costs thing. 20 bucks. Oh. Uh, Game money, <laughs> but still 20 bucks for a movie. Holy crap. <laughs> That actually sounds it's pretty not too realistic. too far off. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, then the third game I'm currently playing uh, is Pokemon X. Uh, okay. I have Pokemon it, Y, but, I have, but Pokemon it, X is the one to play, so apparently. So it's not Pokemon 10? No, it's not Pokemon 10. It's always 10. so confusing. Yeah, it's Pokemon X. So okay, this is good. the first pr properly uh, 3D version of uh, the Pokemon collecting type Pokemon games. Uh, and I'm enjoying it as uh, quite a few other people. Uh, you know, my son Nintendo's uh, plays one of those well. companies. Sorry, uh, so Nintendo's Just, one of those companies where if they didn't have Mario and Pokemon, uh, they'd be dead, right? It's just they have some IP yeah. there that it, I swear is the only reason they still exist. I've often thought <laughs> that that another large company should buy them just for that IP and release it just on their their consoles and stuff. It just you well, know I mean, because that but IP it's is interesting very valuable. you say that because if you think about it, isn't that where Sega was? I mean, uh, Sega had Sonic and, yeah, you know, yeah. what? Well, pretty much Sonic. <laughs> yeah. right. Well, that, that, that's, that's exactly what I was about to say. Is oh, I've been saying for the last you know, eight or nine years that Nintendo, I would love to see Nintendo do, do what Sega did. You know, unfor unfortunately for Sega, the Dreamcast was kind of like their death knell. They, the marketing side of that just blew and, uh, and they didn't you know, make a success out of that. So they then transitioned to be a, a third-party publisher and, and they took advantage of their franchises. Nintendo is their franchises, as you say. It's, yeah. And it's not just Mario. It's Mario, Donkey Kong, Yoshi, you know, Zelda, Pokemon. There's like eight or nine different right. uh, Nintendo franchises that I would just love to see on other consoles other than like the Wii U or something. The only um, reason my yeah. son got a Nintendo DS, we, we got him a 3DS a couple years ago, is because of Pokemon. Right. 
That's it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and everything yep. else on that console is, or handheld, I should say, is really expensive. Like, if you get their version of Plants vs. Zombies, it's like 30 mm-hmm. bucks compared to the yeah. $4 you'll spend on, on any out. of the app stores. Yeah. And yeah. who's going to do that? Well, I mean, he's got Plants vs. Zombies oh, upstairs. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then, and then the last two games I'm playing are these two. Uh, uh, Disney Infinity against Skylander Swap Force. Skylander so Swap Force. How do you Go like on. Infinity? Infinity is um, okay. <laughs> uh, I, I think I'm it's anticipating a, it, that once my kids become aware of it, they're going to start making demands for it. So <laughs> I'm just preparing myself. I, I find the uh, the campaign mode a little clunky. I find the create mode a little bit incomplete. Um, but I think overall, it's a great effort, and definitely for people who who are Disney fans, it's definitely something that you know will not be unenjoyable. It's, it's right. Just yeah, I, I think it's just for me. I've been spoiled by playing the, the two previous Skylanders games, and now Skylanders Swap Force, which I think is Skylanders done right, um, have really polished and honed what that sort of platformer action platformer game is like, and made it really accessible, made it really high quality. Whereas the Disney Infinity games are a little bit sort of the campaign. I mean, is a little bit short and a little bit con- right. concretely put together. So, so. now so for folks Skyland- who've never played. Okay. Skylanders or Infinity, you know, there's there's something pr- you know particularly special about those two games that's unusual for most video games. That's right. Yeah. So so both of these these games are ones that are a, a collectible figurine game in disguise. <laughs> <laughs> so so if you if you are a parent and you're looking at games and you don't know about these. Number one, wow, that's amazing. Um, but number two, be very careful because it can cost you hundreds and hundreds of dollars to actually uh, satisfy the cravings of, uh, of young kids with that one. Um, I, Skyl- I, think the, I think the key phrase there is what's on Pete's T-shirt. I want another Skylanders. Get a job. Get- <laughs> Where's your yeah. money? So my son and daughter are both into the Skylanders uh, stuff. For the- I think we just lost Andrew's nope. audio briefly. Oh, I'm, am I back? You're back now. You've you lost yeah. like okay, cool. the last 10 seconds. I, I think, you know, when you, when you look at Skylanders and you realize that for 75 bucks, it costs you the game uh, and the actual uh, base that you actually plug in, USB base that you plug into mm-hmm. your console, uh, and, you know, say three or four figurines. Uh, <clears throat> but then there's another, you know, I think it's up to about 70, 70 figurines plus wow. uh, six, six different add-on adventure packs that you can get and, uh, you know, power up things so instead of actually earning power-ups in the game you actually have to buy power-ups and put them on the base as well so it's it's a it's it's definitely a good uh it's the microtransactions but they involve going (laughs) to a store and they're not that's right it's like 15 20 bucks for these (laughs) sets of 15 and 20 bucks Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and, and um, in fact, Skylander Swap Force, which is the one, the, the new one, where you, the top and bottom part of the figurines come apart, and you can swap them to the others. So I think there's like 16 different figures, and you can actually swap the tops and bottoms to make 256 combinations or something. Wow. And uh, and and they're like 15 bucks each. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so the old my, ones came so apart my, too, just not deliberately. One of <laughs> one of the most common <laughs> phrases I use with my children at the store is, "Did you bring your money?" That's um, right. Yeah. You know, I want such and such. Did you bring your money? No. Yeah. Should have brought your money. Yeah. Um, but it, it, Tim Hawkins, the comedian, refers to this as the gift of no. I'm giving my children the gift of no. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're just being a or, cheap old man. <laughs> or as or as Jane or as Dave Ramsey would put it, no is a complete sentence. <laughs> <laughs> you're all. It's that's something know, parents terrible. justify to each other to be like mean to their kids. <laughs> The gift of no. I'm giving them the gift of nothing. It's like, no, you're just being a cheap something. <laughs> so anyway. Well, I, I do have Scottish heritage, so at least I've got, you know, some genetic reason for being cheap. Can you give us a good drawl or a roll? And you're not wearing a kilt, right? Not, not on commands. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I hey, do so own a kilt, however. Okay, good. I hope I never see you wearing it. <laughs> it's yeah. just, I don't want to see this. Uh, <laughs> I got married. Get that one kilt. out of your what are you head. About? It's, you have a midi kilt, actually, right? It's only like this long. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. No, this is not a Star Trek kilt. This is a regular, full-on <laughs> Scottish kilt. 
Right. Yes, the and the more on, the better. better. Hey, so Andrew, wow. the the, right. the reason that we brought you on the show, um, besides yeah. to give me somebody else to help uh, insult Andrew Duthie here, is uh, to talk a bit about game stuff, right? So I'm going to talk yeah. about some retro things here in a minute. But uh, since we're halfway through the show and haven't actually discussed anything relevant yet, I thought you might want to talk a bit about uh, what's going on in the game dev world. Uh, I know you've done some things with Unity lately. Yeah, so um, Unity has been like my best friend the last couple of months um, because it allows me to build stuff for all of our platforms. Like, and I, and I know. We're not. This is not a you know 100 Microsoft show, but we are Microsoft people, and uh, and for me, being able to build a game that runs on my desktop, and then I can export it out and build it as a Windows Store app or a Windows Phone app, uh, and then play it on those devices as well, um, without really any any additional development effort required, is is pretty impressive. Um, and so Unity is if you can you back up for it, just a second, yeah, and maybe this is where you're going. Um, but I imagine yeah. a lot of people aren't going to be aware of what Unity is and kind of how it fits in. Yeah. So, yeah, please. Yeah. So Unity is um, a 3D uh, game creation tool. Um, it has um, a, a lot of <laughs> um, a lot of aids and 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 helps uh, for you to cre create create environments. Um, it doesn't like do. Um, uh, it doesn't actually do. <laughs> this back channel is going to be distracting. All right, okay. Um, Sorry. <laughs> it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't allow you to create three D models themselves, but it imp imports three D models from you know Maya or Blender or that kind of stuff. Um, but o over something, say like DirectX, where you have to write everything in code, um, or, or any other sort of uh, you know tool set that that really doesn't help you out unity gives you a lot of stuff for help for, for free um, and so you you might import a, a model into your into your environment and then you have your properties you have um, a whole bunch of different uh, settings and windows that you can then use that to actually interact with um, but so a lot of people and, and, are, are, are probably familiar with XNA right so XNA had a few tools in Visual Studio how does this compare to that it's it's like X and A to the power of infinity. Um, it, <laughs> um, it 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 gives you a three D a three D um, box to actually work in, which you navigate through with your mouse and keyboard and, and stuff, and you can add in you know primitives and primitives are like cubes or spheres. You can add in models, and then you then you start doing the interactions, and and you can do things like each each. Um, uh, object has the ability to have components added to it, and and Unity comes with a whole set of components, such as physics components or audio components, and you can just add these on um, just by basically dragging them onto the object. Uh, and so, for instance, I might add in a uh, let's say I've got a, a beach ball uh, that I've imported in uh, from Google SketchUp, uh, and yep. it's in, in my model. By itself, it doesn't do anything. But then I add a component, say it's a, a physics component, and say it's it's got a, a rigid body, it's got uh, a gravity, uh, it's you know it's affected by kinematics. So now all of a sudden, when I play the game, without me actually having to write any code, without me having to do anything other than say it's got physics and it's got gravity, the ball will drop until it encounters something else solid for it to actually connect with. See? So you can add things like rigid body and collisions and things like that that give you the ability to make these objects interact with one another as well without, without, you without writing exactly. a bunch of code. Exactly. So if you had like that beach ball is, is a rigid body with gravity and then you've got um, a, you know, a, a pile of things that are foam bricks that also have rigid bodies and you throw the ball at the bricks, Unity will actually do all the physics for you and work out how those bricks will interact with the ball and how things will move and, and, and sort of, you know, g go off from, from you know, that, that point of impact. Right. Now so, you said this I mean, lets that's you not trivial stuff either. Um, do stuff on the phone and do stuff on the desktop and, and, and whatnot. Yeah. But this and, also and does, so, what, and so, iOS and Android as well, right? Uh, yeah, pretty much everything. It even yeah. has a web web browser um, version. Um, the cool thing for you know people like us is that uh, once you once you get into scripting, like besides all that drag and drop stuff, you can actually do some scripting behind it as well. And mm -hmm. all that scripting is done in your choice, JavaScript or C sharp, um, or their 
their version of uh, I think it's Rails. Boo is is their other one, but right. JavaScript and C Sharp are the two prominent language they prominent languages they use, and uh, and that's great. And and then um, all that stuff you can actually expose um, for for being used outside your Unity game as well. And so when I was talking about hey, you can export that to, as a Windows 8 game or a Windows Phone game. What happens is, and this is just a little bit technical, but it exports it as a as a Visual Studio project, which you can then open in Visual Studio and do whatever you want with it. So it's uh, uh, you embed it in, as a XAML uh, project, and you can then start coding away on XAML uh, on on the XAML surface that's you know encapsulating that Unity game. So, and so, so that's you, very you different uh, from like. Oh, I'm sorry, Andrew. Go ahead. No, that's right. You mentioned SketchUp. I think one of the interesting things from SketchUp that I that I found there's actually a 3D object library that you can get to from SketchUp. And one of the more interesting models that I found in there was the uh, the the transport tank from the movie Aliens. Mm -hmm. And it was really simple to to grab that model, export it from SketchUp, bring it into Unity. And then build a scene with this tank in there with lighting and everything. And yeah. I just thought, okay, because I'm not a 3D geek at all, you know. And mm -hmm. so for me, like I've, I've downloaded Blender. I've played with it. And I can do the basic objects. I can get the monkey face. I forget what the monkey face's name is. But, you know, I can do that kind of s stuff on a simple level. But trying yeah. to build complex 3D models is something that, I mean, it's much like for me with 2D games, Trying to design assets for a 2D game for me is tough. So, so learning where to find free assets to, as a starting point is a really key piece for me as you yeah. know as a developer. Uh, yeah, and, and you're referring to the SketchUp warehouse, which is yeah. available online. You know, it's like SketchUp.Google.com/slash/3D warehouse, I think it is, um, and you can find models for everything there. So that's that's definitely a place to place to look at. The other place, obviously, is um, Unity itself has this thing called the Asset Store, and people uh, uh, publish their own creations there as well. And that's anything from a you know an individual audio sound or an individual model all the way through to um, you know complete, completely finished and final polished uh, environments ready for you to actually use uh, in your own sort of creations. So. Yeah. Now, you said something about it, it, it being 3D, um, but I think back mm -hmm. in August, there was an announcement about uh, 2D support as well. Yeah, so the next version of Unity, the next um, uh, Unity 4.3, uh, at the Unite conference, uh, as you say, just a short while ago, they announced that that would actually have a better support for 2D. Um, people have been doing 2D games and, and 2D apps in Unity already, but uh, it, it's been... Use a 3D environment and a 3D editor to do 2D work, and it's it's complex um, right. to try and try and work in three dimensions when you only want to use two. Uh, and so the 2D version um, is basically this. It's actually the, all the same UI. It's the same actual app, the same same uh, application that you're running. You're just putting it into 2D mode, and it allows you to um, to, to do everything on on a on a plane as opposed in, as a to a 3D sort of world. Right. And then the other thing is, you mentioned this creates a Visual Studio project, you can script it and everything, and that's different from something like Kodu or eventually Project Spark, which is more you're in the world, and you can't create a game that would be published in one of the stores as a standalone game, um, but you can create things right. that are kind of in that ecosystem, right? Exactly. So with Unity, you can totally publish um, your Unity creations on both the Phone Store and the Windows 8 Store, and there are plenty of Unity um, samples. Uh, I shouldn't say samples because they're complete games. I mean, there's plenty of examples of Unity games being published in those stores, um, particularly the you know Windows 8 Store. Uh, so, uh, G there, I guess I'll call yeah. you G. <laughs> so, are you have you played with this at all? Or are you thinking about uh, working on some games? Played with Unity? Unity. Yes. Yeah, actually, so, I mean, I've been doing a fair amount with, uh, with game development because I'm doing a workshop series here locally in, uh, in the D.C. area. Um, and uh, not this next upcoming game. I've got a game workshop coming up this Saturday, but the one after that in November is actually going to be about Unity. And, you know, Unity is one of those things where I've got a four-hour block of time. I'm not going to teach people how to use Unity in four hours. That's not going to happen. It's a, it is a true full high-end professional development environment for building games. Um, mm -hmm. And 3D game development is not something you teach in four hours to begin with. So the goal 
for that workshop is really going to be a take a look at the the new 2D workflow within Unity itself and B, for folks who already have Unity games, show them some of the things that they can do in Windows 8 or Windows Phone and how to, how to bring that game to that platform. Um, so it's a little different than like my, the one I'm doing Saturday is more focused around you know, uh, building a 2D platformer game with, uh, in, in this case, Construct 2 is another game development toolkit that, uh, that I'm working with. So... Um, so I'm I'm ramping up on on Unity. I wouldn't I certainly wouldn't by any stretch of the imagination call myself an expert yet. Um, I would say I'm a somewhat somewhat experienced tinkerer. Maybe would be a, a an appropriate way of putting it. All right. So yeah. Unity's not the only game in town. Uh, it sounds like it's no. it's one of the more complete development environments and everything. Um, but there's other stuff you had mentioned uh, one just a second ago, Andrew. There's like Mono Game, right? What else is out right. there that that people well, so, are using? So so Monogame is is essentially an XNA API replacement that's open source. So it allows you to essentially build XNA style games using this using the same APIs and develop those for uh, Windows for the Windows Store as well as for other platforms. I, I'm not sure, Andrew. Do you know which platforms Monogame supports outside of Windows 8? Uh, pretty much all of them. Okay, that's that's yeah. what I thought. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I think the thing to understand about Monogame and XNA is ha- is the is the sort of hierarchical structure of, of that or the an- the ancestry. So we have DirectX where you're actually coding you know bare metal DirectX C plus plus code. Right. Then uh, then a pro- project came along called SharpDX, which wrapped DirectX in a managed code layer, so mm-hmm. you can you can write you know direct effectively. A one-for-one replacement. A- anything that took you one line of code in DirectX still takes you one line of code, but it, you can write it in C Sharp with all your managed code extensions and stuff. Um, and then um, Monogame actually wraps Sharp DX uh, and encapsulates a lot of that more complex stuff. So in DirectX, it might take you 25 lines of code to write a shader, um, right. and in in an XNA and Monogame, it takes you one line to declare and, and define and, and instantiate that sh- same shader. So um, th- that's what XNA was designed for, was to actually um, simplify DirectX coding right. in a way that made it accessible to, to more than just the, <laughs> the gurus of DirectX, which I don't think any of us are. So I guess my question to you, Andrew, would be for, for folks who are... Um for ho- folks who are starting out and want to target either multiple platforms or you know Windows Store, um, my sense is that the folks who want to look at Monogame are people who already know the XNA APIs or who've got experience with XNA. Mm-hmm. That it it's not necessarily the you know like if you're starting from zero and I have you know I've got no experience with any platform, I, I would argue personally that HTML and JavaScript has a lower learning curve than just about any of the other platforms in part. Because for a lot of kind of the 2D casual style games, things like Construct 2 just make it really, really easy to build a game quickly and to actually build a pretty polished and, and good looking game um, without having to, to know a whole lot about the underlying code platform. And would you agree with that or would you yeah, I, I th- guide people? I, I think so. Like, you know, if, if you're, if you're ex- an experienced coder, then then the the mono game sort of angle is is the way to go if you're someone who is more graphically inclined and and when i say that i mean like more you, you think more visually than than coding and you don't have any coding experience then i'll be looking at things like unity or game maker or or cocos or you know mm-hmm. any of those other types of tools that actually allow you to rapidly prototype a, a game whether it's 2d or 3d um and then things like game maker um the html5 javascript versus uh, XAML C sharp VB debate is obviously something that is is a, more a, a developer um, thing, um, but uh, definitely HTML5 JavaScript is one of those more cross-platform accessible uh, types of uh, things. So yeah, I'd, I'd I'd probably recommend if someone was looking at that, trying to get into stuff, I'd probably go with UG and, and say that. Cool. Okay. So, so how do people get these? I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you happen to know what the pricing is like or licenses are like for Unity or, or other others? 
Uh, or is it posted somewhere actually. we can refer people to? Yeah. <laughs> so, well, so the good news with Construct 2 is there's a free version available. So you can download it for free. I think Game Maker is exactly the same way. I think they have a free version available. Both of them are a little bit feature limited. But you can get your feet wet and you can build basic games. Um, for the for the Construct 2 folks, basically what they say is, you know, if you're using the free edition, you can't charge for your game. So that's a pretty significant limitation. <laughs> but, you know, if you're charging for your game and you're making money, the, I think the, the personal license is a little over 100 bucks US. It's not too bad. Yeah. Um, and then, Andrew, I'm pretty sure Unity actually now offers free versions that allow you to publish to most of the major platforms. Yeah, yeah. so that's actually a fairly recent thing. So Unity has is, uh, is always offered a free version um, for, for quite, actually, I shouldn't say always, but for quite a while they've offered a free version, but it hasn't given you the, the ability to publish on um, most of the mobile platforms. So in the last... Um, release 4.2.2 I think it was they they expanded the free versions um, abil publishing abilities and now you can actually publish for iOS Android Windows Store Windows Phone desktop web um, I think you can even do Blackberry if you really wanted to go down that route um, <laughs> uh, you know so, so yeah all of that, that is available for free if, if you're building something in Unity you mentioned you can pull it into Visual Studio if you yep. want to optimize for one platform or another, I mean, do you pull it into Visual Studio and then you add hubs and app bars and all that stuff for Windows, and then you pull it into something on the Mac to add those specific controls for iOS? Like, how does that work? That's that's what I would do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That, exactly so, that. Yep. That's so a, the answer. That's is an easy yes. Answer. That's how it works. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I but I would I mean I would argue that for most games. Um, I, I don't know that I'd be, you know, for games in particular, it tends to be a little more uh, free and loosey-goosey in terms of the UI. You know, the, the advice I typically give game developers is just like if you're building an app for the Windows 8 platform, um, you've got to kind of be cognizant of some UI guidelines. When you're building a game, you know, it's a little more you kind of own the UI and yeah, ideally there are certain things you want to tie into, like settings charm and things like that. That that you know the settings panels, and those are things that certainly I think Unity offers some help with. Um, but you know, I tend to be less insistent about things like app bars, for example, because um, they just don't necessarily feel as applicable as kind of native UI in a in a game. Yeah, and it certainly takes away from the immersive factor. Of, of a game to have those those elements. However, that said, and and I didn't ever think I'd say that, um, <laughs> but given um, more and more uh, as, as people using Windows Store apps, they're used to having those things. And yeah. so, as you as you said, you know, you don't even have to tie into the settings charm if you don't want to, because games right. don't traditionally have that. But it makes sense to do that because. That's how I get to settings in every other app that I'm running. Sure, yeah. and that's yeah. a really, I mean, that's an important point. I mean, more so than any kind of, you know, requirements or, or, or uh, you know, or somebody looking over your shoulder and saying, you must do this. Um, you know, the, sometimes the way I explain what you're talking about, Andrew, is you remember when we moved from kind of Windows 3 to Windows 95, and there's a whole bunch of guidance around where you put your file menu and what, you know, if you have an exit or close command, it needs to be on the file menu. And if you have a help, you know, if you have a help menu, it's always at the far right, and it's got your about command. So there's these consistent touch points or or consistent UI elements that make mm -hmm. things easy to find. So I think that's a that's a good point to the contrary of of what I was saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there are games like Adara that have mm -hmm. you know, or a lot of the Xbox games where they have full hubs. And I know those are built right. in XAML, and then they have yeah. like navigation bars inside the app. But then everything in the experience yep. of the game is DirectX. So, yeah, and that, actually, that's a that's a good point. Like uh, Bejeweled is like that, and that's a game. That's a game that a apart from the fact that it's one that I'm addicted to, um, even though it's you know been around forever. Um, but I think that they do a good job of giving the Bejeweled feel within kind of that hub style you know mm -hmm. so you can get your achievements you can get to the different types of games that they support and things like that yeah um you know it's a nice it's a nice kind of bringing of the bejeweled style into kind of that modern app uh 
I know template isn't the way I want the, the, the word I want to use, but um, kind of that look and feel. Yeah. Pete's looking puzzled over here. No, sorry. I'm, and I'm not even on camera at the moment, which is good. Um, <laughs> That's good. Now nah, I'll switch over to me. So I wanted to switch <laughs> gears for a second. Uh, we talked about unity. I mean, and if there are any final words on that, uh, uh, please go ahead and spit them out. I think we can move on. Okay, good. So we've beaten that one. I, th I think the key takeaway is if you want to build good professional games, Unity is a great tool for that, and you can get it for free. So be yeah. be silly not to have it. Yeah, yeah, it's something that I really want to play with. I just haven't had time at the moment. Um, but it's it, it looks like a really great way, not just for building games, but I've thought about mm -hmm. it for like visualizations and stuff. You know, I'm into music apps. And I started thinking, well, with the new 2D engine and the 3D stuff in there, or the, the 2D support and the 3D support, you could probably do some interesting things there when you couple it with your own optimized audio engine. So it could be yeah. pretty interesting. Do you, Pete, do you remember the, there was a 3D, I think it might have been WebGL, um, it was a 3D web thing that I sent you that, that had um, visualization of audio in sort of a, yeah, yeah. a, yeah, that was a pretty cool. perspective thing. That was... That was pretty wild. We should find a. I should see if I can find a link to that and um, put it in the show notes because that was yeah, a very should. cool use of kind of three D technology. Right. So you guys uh, probably all know that I'm I'm into retro games and and just Commodore what? and Atari and all that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> Get out! Um, <laughs> no way. People have heard that. I've got you, behind you, all my you piles probably don't of crap even call them retro. No, man. They're they're still current. Well, and retro that's actually retro, what I wanted to get to. Pete's middle name. So, did you guys know that people are still producing cartridges for the Commodore 64? Really? I have one That's in cool. my hand right here. This is a cartridge Soulless. for the C64. Uh, you see, it's in a little box. It's got the game screenshots and, and stuff in the back. This, this is, is a all classic new development. It's still being produced. This is all this new is all development. New. Um, I have a wow. bunch of them up there. So, here's the wow. cartridge. Right, so this is. Oh, here we go. This is yeah. totally a legit no, card. Yep, yep. I wow. see that PCB there. Um, and these are brand new, right? So this this wow. one's actually a year or two old, right? But still, in relative terms, here it's brand new. And there are yeah. a bunch of places, and I'll and I'll I'll put some show notes on there, where they are doing game of the month type stuff for Commodore sixty four, of the month. Huh. So wow. people are just still developing these either as downloadable to run in your uh, emulators or you could order an actual cartridge, which I thought was That's amazing. Wild. Like, I didn't even know that was going yeah. on. Right. And, and, and really, seriously. Oh, we've lost your audio there, uh, Andrew. Lost audio again. Oh, oh, there, there you go. go. Back. There you go. Yeah. No, I was just saying, you know, Commodore 64, 30, that's 30 years ago. Like, yeah. I don't, That's <laughs> the a mind lot. boggles. Yeah, and sort of wow. So there were still that competitions. Pretty wild. So Northern Europe, like where it's dark all the time, like when you go from like <laughs> way north in Europe, um, the C sixty four compos and stuff are still a big deal. Where every single year, people are writing demos, uh, and there's a competition for who writes the best demos. And you know the demos are what always push the graphics and push the sound to the the kind of the as far as you can go there are still right. new ones every single year actually i think there are multiple every year with lots of participants so uh, that's very cool too now i think it might have to do with the fact that it's really cold and dark up there a lot of times of the year <laughs> and the c64 is kind of like uh you know a good pastime um but it could just be that there's just such an amazing amount of talent up there for people who are coding assembly on a processor that's that's pushing 40 years old uh, is yeah. you know, that's just amazing to me. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I was. I mean, I can remember back in oh, probably the you know early '90s. You know, just sitting for probably hours on end. Um, you know, going through different demos and 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 also the other big thing for for C64 was mod trackers. That was yes, you know that yes. was a, that was another one that you know. And I was never I was never the guy who was writing them. But I would sit for hours on end and just be mesmerized watching these demos that people had written or listening to these mod tracks and, um, you know, really just very creative stuff with limited resources. And sometimes, you know, I mean, sometimes I wonder, you know, you think about kind of 
Um, you look at like Jesse Freeman, one of one of my coworkers, and he he works with uh, Impact JS, which is mm-hmm. you know definitely some a an environment that is designed more for kind of low scale graphics and you know low res and kind of that eight bit. Um, it, you know, kind of style of development, and I and I look at some of the, the the games that he's written, and I and I do have to wonder whether sometimes limiting yourself, limiting your palette, if you will, um, can have some real benefits. Um, yeah, compared to kind of being overwhelmed by choice or overwhelmed by the 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 things that you can do. Right, you get really creative when you only have a little bit of room to work with. Like, here's another cartridge I picked up. Check out that box art. That is classic wow. stuff right there. So not yes, only are these people icon, doing the cartridges, but they've gone full full bore here, and they've come up with all this really great box art. Now, it's funny. is I have these. I've never played these. Uh, I downloaded the, um, uh, the images to use in the emulator, but I just had to have these cartridges just because they were so cool. Like this one's a clear yeah. cartridge. So, do, you, do, you actually, do you actually have a C64 set up somewhere and actually attached to a screen? Uh, my C128, sure just the other day, thing. I disconnected it um, because I had to make some more room behind me. But I've had mm-hmm. one set up uh, until a, like a few days ago. Uh, I've got a video right. of my son playing Choplifter when he was three years old. Oh, it, Choplifter. Which is, great, which is great stuff. All right, that's, so let's say that... Classic. Uh, so, so let's say you don't want to get a whole you know, bread box or an Atari 2600 and deal with finding a CRT, which... Uh, is surprisingly difficult these days, uh, especially if you want to find one that's compatible. There are other ways that you can do this this kind of very restricted development, uh, almost 8-bit, but not quite. And so I've got with me here a pink one. Ah, uh, your pink uh, one. Pink Fez Gamo. Now, Andrew Duffy, you've got one as well, right? I do. Not yep. pink. I have mine. Yours is No, black. not pink. I have mine. And yours yours doesn't actually have any software on it, does it? No, hold your down a just a little. Simple, oh, hold sorry. Mine has go. a little yep. simple pong game on it. Uh, let's see. I had this problem the last time. It's trying to actually play this uh, backwards. Yeah. Good luck with that. <laughs> through the camera. Play that through there the reflection of the video. Yeah. There you go. See, I, I, I got one bounce. that better? So, there we go. So, Andrew, we, we said we were going to talk a bit more about these. So, why don't you uh, tell us about hey, you how go. you, you code it. for that and, and well, how so it fits into what we're talking the, about. So the Gamo, which is, and I don't, let's see, I think I'd have to unscrew it to actually show most of its innards. Um, yeah, I've just got the battery case here. So the Gamo underlying this is a microcontroller that runs the .NET Micro Framework. Um, and this is manufactured by a company called GHI. Um, and they are a big, uh, they're a big manufacturer for .NET Micro Framework and Gadgeteer boards. They've got a ton of stuff. You can go visit them at ghielectronics.com. Um, but this was actually, uh, Fez Gamo was their first effort at using Kickstarter. Um, and so they had designed uh, the Fez Gamo and wanted to kind of uh, both, ga- I think, gauge interest in the platform as well as you know, get some funding to, to kind of get the, the production ramped up. So they uh, put it up on Kickstarter. I'm sure we'll have the link on uh, on our show notes at, toward the end. Yep. Um, but basically, you program this with Visual Studio, um, and you use uh, you know basically you you send it bitmaps. Um, you know you do some very fairly low level programming as you know modern gaming goes. Um, and there's actually there is an emulator available, so you don't even actually have to have to have the hardware. You can write some code and test it on their emulator. And the 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 GHI community has also provided um, several example games. So uh, there's one uh, that's a Tetris clone. Um, I think there's a Pac-Man clone that that will that will run on Fez Gamo. So there's already some example code that you can use to kind of get started and. You know, it, this is not going to give you the kind of resolution. I mean, I think the the screen is, I want to say, two forty by one sixty or something like that. I mean, it's a it's a fairly low resolution screen, and as you can yep. probably tell from the size in my hands, it's not a large unit at all. But in terms of, um, you know, it's got directional buttons, it's got A B C buttons. It's also got um, expandability. So inside the case here, there are several what are called gadgeteer sockets. 
uh, which provide a standardized pinout pattern for adding additional components. So if you wanted to go in and add um, a sensor to it um, or some additional input, like an analog stick, um, you could totally do that. And then um, I think actually on the PCB itself, there's actually a space for soldering on a Bluetooth module. So you could add uh, Bluetooth communication to this. So there's a lot of possibilities for something, you know, just in terms of either prototyping or just, you know, if you're somebody who likes to get down in the hardware in addition to programming the software, you know, this is a great deal and it's not terribly expensive. I'd have to look up and see. Uh, so let's see what you they're... mentioned you code for it Go in ahead. Visual Studio. Uh, so how yes. does the code actually get on this? I don't see any USB ports. So this one uh, actually comes with a cord, a cable, which, and I have to confess, I've not pushed any code to mine yet. I'm still running on the demo that, that came with it. Um, but the cable that comes with it is actually um, an eighth inch, like the three ring jack that you'd find with stereo oh, yeah. plus, uh, plus microphone. So that's it on one end. That plugs into the gamo, And on the other end, it's standard USB. So obviously oh, it's doing some kind of conversion of the signal, but basically what that allows you to do is use uh, the, uh, you know, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but basically a standard audio port for connectivity. Um, so that's right. how you connect it to your computer. I wonder now, how while fast you were talking, I cracked mine open. Uh, oh, good. Just to see here. <laughs> Perfect. So, um, so you could probably hear me noodling away with stuff. But inside, so here's the PCB with the screen on it. Oh, shoot. Uh, Do not drop here's, it. Let's, here we go. Let's see if that focuses. There we are. So there's the processor. You see a couple extra sockets. Uh, I see the speakers kind of dangling off of it. Uh, you see, it's not super complex. Hey, come right. on, focus. Focus. Here, here. There we go. <laughs> Obviously, there's a limited You're focus range. you making your camera lose its focus. Yeah, I know. So I find this very interesting because we talked about things like the Commodore 64, right? And the, the 6510 right. that's in that would be pretty much considered a microcontroller these days. I mean, that's how they started. Nobody ever actually expected somebody Let's, to build a computer around it. Um, what was the speed of that? Do you know off the top uh, of your head? It was one megahertz. So the, so the Gamo is a Cortex M4 168 megahertz microprocessor. It's got yeah. a, a, a megabyte of flash memory it's got 192k of RAM for your programs. 320 by 240 is the is the uh, display. It's got Which accelerometer built into it. Which is rows larger than the C64. Yeah, exactly. So it's uh, you know it's not. I mean, compared to you know 1080p, it's not very high resolution. But compared to some retro gaming gaming options, you know, plenty of resolution. So you know, this goes to what you guys in. are saying about. Uh, uh, you know how complex games are and stuff where and sometimes being right. restricted is better because it's a lot easier to create something that looks decent when you've got 320 by 240 pixels than it is when mm -hmm. you know you're going to have hd resolution and the expectations are really really high in fact games right. produced back around c64 time frame the developers were often the graphics artists as well and even some of them did the music right so you'd see the games mm -hmm. have one name on it because this is the one guy who is responsible for the whole thing and this kind of brings right. that back yeah and the and the i mean the other thing about this the the gamo is 79 bucks okay it's yeah. basically a little bit more than the cost of one game for for modern consoles Right, I mean, what the modern console games are? What sixty bucks now? Yeah, yeah, sixty. You know, bucks. sixty bucks new. So for twenty bucks more, you're getting something that you can kind of build your own games and really, you know, kind of get more down in the guts of it. And you know, again, for people who are just gamers, not you know, not kind of makers, if you will, um, this is probably not something that's going to be terribly interesting. They just want to take pre-existing made stuff and play the games, and that's fine. Um, but for somebody who's kind of got that heart or soul of a maker, you know, and wants to create their own stuff, um, I think this is a really cool way of, you know, being able to kind of jump back in and, and you know, get back to that kind of gaming route, um, you know. Right. And, and this is uh, the kind of thing that would be great with your kids. I think, uh, mm -hmm. you know, where Project Spart would probably be great for younger kids and, and even older, you can create some really cool stuff. But if you want to get them right. more involved in the, the, the real hard, hardcore coding and the hardware side, this to me would make an awful lot of sense. 
I mean, there was a great quote, uh, and I honestly don't remember who to attribute it to, but uh, it said, with the computers back in the early 80s, when you turn them on, you had to make a conscious mm -hmm. decision not to program, right? Because when you, <laughs> when you booted, you booted directly into the, the, the interpreter, right? That was the way yeah. Uh, yeah. Apple IIs worked, the way Commodore 64s worked, uh, TRS-80s, all of them kind of basically uh, just booted into a basic interpreter. So now um, we, we've lost that. Uh, and at mm -hmm. the same time, you know, the, the, the level of effort required to get started in programming is significantly higher. And one of the things I like about Gadgeteer and, and .NET Micro Framework is once you've got the IDE up, it's actually quite simple to learn to, to program in it. There aren't a whole lot of other tools you need to use. Uh, there aren't, uh, you know, massive IDs and stuff that you have to mess with because everything is, is pretty self-contained right there within a, a, you know, a couple pages inside Visual Studio. Right. Absolutely. Cool. So, Andrew, are you going to write any games for this? Both Andrews, actually. Uh, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, like you, it's, you know, the, the limiting factor is a, is a matter of time. So, yep. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's on my list, if you will, in terms of, uh, you know, the things I want to do, especially with the boys. I mean, you know, we had talked earlier about, um, about Kodu, and you know my oldest Joseph is is ten, and he's he is mad for Kodu. I mean, he he loves just building worlds and building worlds. He and his brother were. I mean, they probably spent a couple hours the other day just you know giggling and and having a good time with you know loads of octopuses and motorcycles and water and islands and you know whatnot. And you know my I mentioned my wife had had her birthday just the other day, and my my older son's birthday present for his mom was he built her a world in Kodu. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's interesting. Like, you know, I, I, you know, it's, it, and he's just that into it. It's just, you know, he built one for his grandmother. He built one for, for his mom. You know, he just, he loves building worlds. And so I can't wait to see what he does when he gets his hands on a, on project spark. Yeah. And whether or not my oh, kids programs for this spark. at all, is going to depend on on uh, if I can get it back together. It's one of those things. Six <laughs> screws came out, but there's only four screws on my desk right here. So I need to figure out where all the rest went. Uh, on the so fly we, disassembly yeah. at its finest. So we mentioned Project Spark a bunch of times. Uh, Andrew Parsons, is there something we can say about that? Like, like what's besides being a cool shirt? Uh, what can we say about Spark? I, I think uh, Project Spark is, you know. Uh, we, yeah, you know, we're, we're we're moving towards the you know, that the beta that they that they've been pushing towards. They've shown it off at a bunch of different places. Project Spark is basically Kodu all grown up, if if we want to <laughs> describe it right. that way. And for people not familiar um, it's, with Kodu, Kodu is a visual game creation tool. Um, okay. Now, what what's really cool is it's it can all be done with an Xbox controller. Can be done with mm -hmm. keyboard mouse, but Xbox controller and you basically just use your thumbsticks to move around an, an environment and you plug things on by pressing buttons and and then you have these radial menus that pop up you know kind of like flower petals where you actually pick pick from stuff and, and then it drills down further and further into the detail so you might say hey when when my object sees this other object then do this then do that so it's it's this sort of radial menu it's all visual but what it's actually doing is it's actually teaching programming you know, mm -hmm. sort of guerrilla tactic type way, right? Um, and so anyone who's creating creating worlds in Kodu uh, or Project Spark is actually learning how to code as well in in a pretty pretty way. And so yeah, and Kodu so Kodu looked like Minecraft, quite honestly, right? It had that same sort of voxel thing going on. Um, yeah. So Spark looks quite different, right? It, yeah, as I said, it all, all all grown up. If you if you go to projectspark.com, uh, you'll actually have uh, you know that's where you can actually sign up for the beta, as well as see some of the the trailers uh, for for what it looks like. But it's it's pretty magical um, in the way it, it creates stuff. Yeah. Uh, I'm demoing it uh, at uh, the GDC next conference next next month. Great, awesome. Uh, my son is seven, well, and he's really looking forward to it. So it'll be nice to see that. Yeah, and the thing, one of the things that I th that I've been very impressed with the demos of Project Spark is um, some of the intelligence that's built into the characters. 
So it's not just a matter of, oh, you know, let me, uh, you know, create this character and it doesn't do anything unless I move the move it around with my Xbox controller. Um, instead, you can, you know, create goblins who, you know, who know how to do certain things without, you know, a bunch of stuff, um, you know, without without interaction with an individual. They just have their own kind of intelligence built in. Uh, there's yeah, actually a term. Them- they call them brains, right? Brains. I was like, I couldn't remember what the <laughs> what the term for it was, of course. But uh, you brains. know, brains, brains. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but but the Project Spark um, Facebook page is also quite uh, quite lively. It's not one of these ones that's just been a static page. They actually publish up um, a Twitch fi- Twitch feed. Uh, uh, on a weekly basis, uh, dr- drilling into you know creating different worlds or different different techniques and actually cr- how to create different things, um, and so it, it some of the complexities in there are, are pretty amazing that they've shown off already, and uh, it's, it's going to be something that I, I can't wait. You know, my my son he's he's 16, but he he was Minecraft mad as well, and I know my my nephews are all Minecraft mad. I I think. Uh, <laughs> we lost your audio again, like um, Andrew. The what's the what is the um, what is the Facebook page for Project Spark? Uh, let me. F- well, you can put it, it in the show notes. That, oh. Yeah, it's um. Yeah, yeah, but well, one one thing I loved about it um, is is the ability to remix existing levels, so you can play play something and say, "Hey, I'd love to see how that works," or "I'd love to you know grab the, that chunk of." that game and copy it into my game or you know all that kind of stuff and and you can take a level and just remix it completely um and and that's that's really cool as well what my son is really excited about here and and quite honestly one thing i like as well is uh, with project spark you don't need to be sitting in front of the xbox to do it um he can use Mm -hmm. his pc upstairs to create his worlds and then as i understand it at least from what the the demo guys were saying at, at build and whatnot is he can then publish it in a way that he can uh, play that on the Xbox, which if you're a kid, the idea of being able to design something on the computer and then you can go play it on the console, that's got to be a bit of a rush. Yeah. And for what it's worth, I don't know if you were aware, Pete, but there is actually a version of Kodu for the PC. Um, I don't think it has the ability to save uh, to save the games and, and open them up on the Xbox, but you can actually... Uh, install a version of Kodu right. on on the PC and that's that's actually how my son does it. Yeah, it's it's the link between the two that I think my son is yeah. most interested in. And the other reason I'm interested in it is because uh quite honestly he won't have to hog up you know we have one TV in the house with plenty of screens but only one <laughs> of them is actually a TV with the Xbox on it. Uh so right. but at least he'll be able to create his worlds without hogging up the TV. Uh, the, I mean, the other thing is just the the visual style of what I've seen from Project Spark is just, I mean, it's just orders of magnitude beyond what Kodu is. You know, I yeah. mean, Kodu stuff just in some ways looks very flat. Um, there are, you know, there is some variety in terms of what you can do, but um, it really is very basic. And and you know, again, back to that notion of creativity and limitations. You know, that can be a good thing. But at the same time, being able to easily paint scenery that's as beautiful as what Par- Project Spark has shown so far, um, that's a pretty compelling uh, value prop there. I, I think that's going to be very, very cool. Mm-hmm. Nice. So what happens with the Project Spark? So you create a game or a world in Project Spark, and then is it accessible to other people? Do you know? I mean, is this something other people can play? We don't know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that's obviously a question. <laughs> We've- that We've either can't Andrew be answered, speechless. or we're not sure. So I'll just leave that one. Up. It can't, it can't, it can't be answered at this point. But, but basically, the idea is you, you, you will be able to share content. You will be able to take content that has been shared. Um, you'll be able to search through it, rate it, all that kind of stuff. Um, and as I said just earlier, you can you can take content, and you can remix that um, oh, cool. in, into your own content and stuff too. So I guess we'll have to uh, you know wait for the beta and see what it has <laughs> for capabilities. Uh, did you guys yes, order on Xbox One? You guys ordered an yeah, Xbox absolutely. One. Yeah, oh, I've I got have, mine. Yeah, mine's ready I have to mine go. Pre-ordered. Yeah, yeah. Uh, PlayStation. How hardcore are you? Uh, no. This yeah. is the uh, first generation no. I have not pre-ordered the PlayStation. Yeah, 
Um, yeah, see, see, I've never been particularly interested in PlayStation. I was a big Nintendo guy for a long time, so I had the N sixty four or the I had the the Super NES. I had the N sixty four, including the extra RAM upgrade, the little cartridge that you popped in, so you could actually play some of the later games. Um, and uh, I did have a Wii, and we finally we were actually a two console household. We had the Xbox three hundred and sixty and the Wii, and we finally ended. It up never gets old, does it, Pete? No, it doesn't. I think we're gonna give that as the show title. I did have a Wii. What's that? I had. I didn't I have had a Wii. Wii. <laughs> I had a Wii. <laughs> Sorry, but you know, but the reality is that two consoles it takes up more space, and we found we were playing the Xbox, especially once we got the Connect. We found we were playing the Xbox a lot more frequently than the Wii. Yeah. And although there are still a few games that my, my kids go next door to their uh, friend next door's house to, to play, like I think Mario Kart is still you know a huge big one for them. Yep. It, it just wasn't enough reason for us to have two consoles. So, Yep. Very cool, guys. So any uh, closing words on uh, game development for today? Nothing. Well, I, I think, well, first of all, anybody in the mid-Atlantic area needs to be at my game development workshops Saturday, this Saturday the 19th and, uh, and uh, November 23rd, Reston, Virginia. Um, and you can go to our DC Baltimore Windows app developers meetup group to find those. I'll, we'll have the link in the show notes. Okay. Um, but yeah, definitely but anybody in the DC area should come join me for those. I l- would love to see everybody. Um, you know, but just go and make some games. You know, there's lots and lots of ways to make games. Just start and have fun and play. Great. What about you, Mr. Parsons? Anything you're allowed to say as final words? (laughs) (laughs) As as the show's gone on and my and my energy levels have been sapped, I'm very conscious of saying things that I'm not supposed to say. No, I think. uh, Look, we've we've talked about a bunch of stuff. You know, (laughs) anything. (laughs) Anything from DirectX to Unity to to Cocos and Game Maker to you know like this Gameo thing, which I, I haven't actually seen myself, so uh, you know it's really interesting. You guys both have them. You know, it must be some an East Coast thing. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's a hardware geek thing. Um, yes. I, I know we were talking about Jesse earlier, and I know that Jesse had that that um, article on his blog just recently uh, about building that mini arcade machine. Yeah, the, the Windows that tablet. Cool. That, yes, that was very cool. The uh, other th- I want to. Go on. The other thing that Jesse has that I would recommend anybody who's into game development at all is he keeps a, a dev diary, um, and he's just got some brilliant stuff up there. He's actually started using Vine to do just really short demos of some of the work that he's doing on his games. Um, you know, and it's just it's all very easily consumable. So go check out De- Jesse Freeman's dev diary. We'll have a link. Okay. Yeah, yeah. all those links will be in the show notes. Well, I want to cool. thank you, Mr. Uh, Andrew Parsons. There for uh, coming on Thank the you. show. Thanks. It was great hey, no having problem. you on here. Even though you're not allowed to say stuff, we're glad you said what you did say. And if there's anything that's going to hey, get yeah. you fired, let me know and I'll make sure to highlight it in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure you would do that for me. All yes. right, guys. Uh, th- thanks Thank for you. Me, guys. So wait, I don't get a thank you.